If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 22. And then, Brother Kyle, if I can help you, uh, have your help with some pads to pass out. We are, as a church, going to send out, thank you, sir, care packages to our college students. And uh, I uh, always, in college, appreciated getting these packages from First Baptist Church. I started coming to First Baptist Church when I was in college. In fact, uh, my parents dropped me off at, at uh, college, and then the next week they started coming here. And so all my college days were known at First Baptist Church, and I got a care package each year from them. And uh, every time you got one of these care packages, and we pack them in one of those paper boxes, about like this and like this, when that box, if you got that box, you'd get mugged on the way back to your room. All right? And people would ask, well, where, who's that from? I'd say, well, my church. And they'd say things like this, boy, my church never sent that stuff to me. Your church must really love you. All right, and so this is one way we can encourage our students who are at college, all the college students will get a care, care package, no matter what college they're at. And if you can help us sign up for some things and, and uh, bring in some things, the only thing we ask you not to bring in, the only thing, is bars of soap. Bars of soap, and people don't use bars of soap much anymore, so I don't think it'll be an issue, but bars of soap have a way of infiltrating everything in that box. And those delicious chocolate chip cookies that you made now taste like dial. I'll tell you what they'd love, gift cards to Walmart. That works everywhere in the U.S., I promise you. And they love chocolate chip cookies and things like that. So if we can spoil our college kids, I'd love to have your help in that. Sign up on those pads if you would, please. And open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. As we look at today, finish up where we began last week with the accounts of Abraham and Isaac. We're in this month of stewardship, and uh, we have this morning service. Then after I dismiss and pray and get done with the service, we'll go down to the gym. We're going to have a great meal. Pastor Scott's been laboring since yesterday with some good help. Pastor Ryan's been helping him. And how many smelled the food when you came in? How many are just praying, praying to the God of heaven that I will preach shorter today? Well, we'll find out if you're a good prayer warrior or not now, won't we? Uh, I will find out who I'm going to have to pray for me if I, when I get done. No, I, I, uh, I will be done uh, as, just when the food is done. How's that sound? No, nah, we'll, we'll keep on a good schedule this morning, go down there, and have another service down there. But we're in the month of stewardship at First Baptist Church. You see it on our two signs on, on the wall over there. And our big theme for this year is to believe God. But this month is stewardship month, or how we treat the possessions and the things and the talents that God has given to each one of us. We often get into the comparing game. Well, I'm not as rich as so-and-so because they have two cars. I only have one and one up on blocks in my yard. I'm not as rich as them because my house only has 1,500 square feet and their house has 1,700 square feet. Boy, they're way better off than me because they get three and a half weeks of paid time off PTO and I only get three weeks and two days. We get in that comparing game, don't we? We don't normally compare the other direction. We don't normally, it's not natural to say, wow, I am well off because I get three weeks, two days, and that person only gets two weeks. Normally, we're in the comparing of, boy, someone has more. I was reminded of this again being in Ghana uh, with the summers a couple weeks ago about how wealthy all of us are. We're all at different places financially and talent-wise, sure. But all of us in this room in America, we are wealthy beyond belief, beyond measure. Where the average or, or, or a decent job in Ghana, what they told me, the missionary told me, would be maybe 600 to 800 CDs. That's not dollars, that's CDs, and the CD exchange rate is about 5.6, that's what we paid, so it would be roughly, roughly, maybe 300 at the most dollars, 400 a month, and that's a great job. A normal job there, would, doing some labor, would be maybe 200 CDs. A month, a month. If I just made that to dollars and I only paid you 200 a month, if I just made that dollars and paid you $200 a month, you would not say, I've got a great job now, would you? You know what you'd say? I'm broke. We are blessed. 
We're in the month of stewardship where we look at what God asks and what we do. And in this particular passage, it struck me as I was studying and reading my Bible about what God asked of Abraham. If you would look, please, in Genesis chapter 22, verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. We looked at that last week that that is not a temptation for evil. That is a proving. That is God saying, Abraham, what's really in your heart? Do you think God knew what was in Abraham's heart? I think he did. Do you think Abraham knew what was in Abraham's heart? Do we know what's in our heart? We'd like to think we do, but I believe part of this was more, was more for Abraham's sake than for God's sake. And God put a test to Abraham, and we all know what tests are. We've all been to school. Most people don't like tests. Most people don't say, woo-hoo, it's almost exams. I can't wait. Exams. And God brought an exam to Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am, a great response from any servant of the Lord. And he, that's God, said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. You notice a clarification. Abraham, take Isaac. Who is Isaac? Your son. Which son? The one you really love. So, I, so Abraham could not miss what God was asking of him. Sometimes we want to play that game with God. Oh, you mean this one. This thing you want. I didn't, I didn't know you wanted this. God says, take Isaac, thine only son, thy son, whom thou lovest. That's the one I'm talking about, Abraham. And get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. We looked at this part last week about the background of Abraham. How he didn't grow up with a, with a Christian background. In fact, the Bible tells us that his grandfather was a worshiper of false gods. It references his father as well. And somewhere in there, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly where, but somewhere in there, before Genesis chapter number 12, Abraham believed in the God of the universe and became a worshiper of Jehovah. But it wasn't because he grew up that way. We can't use that as, as an excuse. Well, I didn't grow up that way, Pastor. Neither did Abraham. I didn't have the same thing someone else had. Well, la-di-da. Because my obligation to serve God and my opportunity to serve God is not based upon my parents. Now, I hope as a as a, as a parent and who is a safe parent to provide my kids with more opportunities and a better foundation than Abraham would have had. But if I don't, my kids can't say, well, it's my dad's fault, it's my mom's fault. No, no, no. Abraham followed God. In verse number three, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand, and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the, and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? How would you have answered that question? Hey, Dad, we're obviously going to sacrifice. Now, think about something here. I want you to catch something here that's not part of the message, but just a side note. Abraham and Isaac are walking and they have wood and they have a knife. So Isaac assumes they're going to go what? Sacrifice. Why did he assume that? Because he'd seen it before. You see that? He'd seen this before. His, his, Father Abraham was not, this was not the first time that his, he'd seen his dad worship the Lord in this way. You see that? Oh, that's good right there. That's good to know that, that Isaac knew this is what happened. And because he noticed what was happening, he'd obviously been with his father before at these burnt offerings. Come on, parents. Those who have an example to others. Where are we going, Mom and Dad? To church. 
Well, I've never been to church before. You see, Isaac asked, Hey, Father, I, have, I see the wood and I see the, the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham, in verse 8, I would say a prophetic statement. He, Abraham said, My son. I wonder if you can hear the emotion in that, those two words, my son. Referencing back to verse number 2 where God says, Take your son, thine only son whom thou lovest, Isaac, my son. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Oh, the prophecy that, that Jesus Christ would come to this wicked world. He'd live a sinless life and die on a cruel cross, provide himself a lamb. Oh, Abraham, I don't know that you knew about, about exactly what Jesus would do, but you knew about Jesus. You knew about the promises because that's how he got saved, looking to Jesus. And in these words, you provided a prophecy for all of us of Christ, the perfect lamb. Those last words of verse 8, so they went both of them together. Lord, I thank you for your word and for this time. Lord, help us as we look at this. Would you touch our hearts and our lives? Would you challenge us about what we want to give to you? Lord, and how the things sometimes of this earth we hold so strongly. In Jesus' name, amen. We look at this message last week. We looked at the request of God, and sometimes what God asks of us seems to be unfair and seems to be difficult and seems to be unjust. Notice I chose the word seems to be because we know that God is always righteous. He is always just, but he's not always fair. Fair is a word that we use in our estimation, Fair, if we're going to use fair, then, then only bad people should get sick. That would be fair, right? Only bad people should have bad things happen to them, and good people should always be healthy, and good people should always have good things happen. That would be, in our estimation, fair. But God does not operate on our limited fairness idea. God is just. He is right. He is true, and He is faithful. And, and so here there are times in our lives that what God asks of us will not seem to be fair, will not seem to be just, and will seem to be difficult. God, why are you asking this of me? Why my son, God? Well, why, why not someone else's son? And we saw last week the request, but today I want to look at the response of Abraham found in verse number three. The first thing I see is this, there was no delay. Verse number three, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. If that was you, if that was me, would you sleep in that day? If you knew you were going to follow God, would you sleep in? Would you have one last breakfast with your family? Or would you, or would you have a, maybe play a game, have some family devotions, but not Abraham? God asked him to do it, and he instantly, he quickly got up. I see his obedience with no delay. There was no discussion. There's no discussion here. He, he took his two young men, he took Isaac, and he took some wood. I don't think he told Sarah what was going on. I have a wife. I have two sons. Unlike Abraham in this story, I love both of my sons, all right? And if I told Doreen, Doreen, God has asked me to sacrifice Johnny. Now, my wife's a spiritual lady. She is. She's a spiritual lady. She's also a mom. Can you imagine the discussion that would ensue after that, that, that statement? Come on. Come on, husband. Can you imagine that discussion right there? Are you sure that's God? Now I've got to convince her of that thing. I don't, I mean, maybe he did. The Bible didn't tell us, but I, I kind of imagine that, that he just got up and began to obey the Lord like he was supposed to do. Knowing that, that God had spoken to him and his obligation was to obey. I see no discussion there. I see no distraction. It says there the, he, uh, he went toward the place that God had told him to. If that was you, if that was me, would you take the long route there? You say, well, I'm supposed to go over there, but I'm going to go this way for a while and this way for a while. We have that in us, don't we? When there's something hard to do, we want to put it off a little bit. We want to wait a little bit and say, I'll, I'll handle this phone call in three hours. I'll deal with this tomorrow. Sometimes it's with the doctor. You feel a little sick, but if you don't go to the doctor, it's not really there. You put off the hard things. 
sometimes with a problem. But I see with Abraham, there was no delay, there was no discussion, there was no distraction, and there was no doubt in his mind. That's what he says in verse number 8. My son, God, will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. It's a natural question from Isaac. But I, res- I see a response of faith from Abraham. Our theme for this year is, I believe God. When Isaac asked his father, Father, where is the lamb? Abraham, in essence, says this, God will provide himself. I believe God. Isaac, you can believe God. Your daddy believes God. Don't worry, Isaac, it'll be okay because I believe God. We looked at last week what Abraham knew of God. God in the Old Testament is revealed by his names. He knew God as Jehovah, the great I Am. He knew God as uh, the everlasting one. He knew God as the one who was the supreme judge of mankind and highly exalted El Shaddai. And he knew enough of God to say, Isaac, your father believes God, and don't worry, son, because you can believe God as well. And friend, can I tell you something? You can believe God as well. You say, I don't know how I can give anything to God. I don't know how I can afford it. Listen, friend, you can believe God. He's never proven himself to be unfaithful. He is always right. He is always true. How is your faith in God? Maybe he asks you to teach a Sunday school class. For some of us, that's like the biggest sacrifice in the world. Do you believe God? He asks of your finances, do you believe God? He asks you to be willing to commit your children to him. First Baptist Church, we don't baptize babies. Other denominations do that, and and often it holds a religious significance. Some even believe that a baby is saved going to heaven when they're baptized. The Bible does not teach that at all. The Bible teaches, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. All right, And a a baby can't do that at at that age. What we do do, we do baby dedications. We find that in the Old Testament with Hannah where she dedicated her baby to the Lord. And we did that with our three children. Lord, these are your children. You you, you let us watch them right now and raise them, but they're yours. Whatever you call them to, that's fine. There's been children who have been called to the mission field and parents talk them out of it because the parents didn't want to let them go. There have been kids who have been called to a Christian college And parents, talk them out of it. You can't go that far. That's so far away. Can I tell you something? That's a bunch of hogwash. We live in 2020. How far is college? The farthest point of college would be, what, Alaska? We can get there in just a few hours for a few dollars. If you don't want to get there on a plane, you've got these things called phones. You can FaceTime and you can Skype. You can text message. It's like your kids never left home. But as parents, we don't want to dedicate our kids to the Lord. What is God asking? I see with Abraham a response of absolute faith. If you would, hold your finger in Genesis 22 and turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, a tremendous passage that speaks of Abraham in Hebrews chapter number 11. If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11 chapter on faith in the Bible, and of course, Abraham is listed in the great chapter on faith, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 17 of Hebrews 11, where the Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, remember that? God tried him. He proved him. When he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Listen, if I had no other verse in the Bible but that one, that would be enough to help me give of my measly finances to the Lord. Because Abraham was willing to give his only begotten son, as was our heavenly Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? John chapter 3, verse 16. Verse 18 of Hebrews 11. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And here it is, verse number 19 accounting 
that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You can turn back to Genesis chapter 22. What that passage tells us is that Abraham had so much faith that he said, God, you can have Isaac. I even believe that you can raise him up from the dead. Now think with me here. Back in Genesis chapter number 22, the Bible was not in the same form as as it is today. We can read the Bible and we see places that God has raised people up from the dead. According to what I see and read, Abraham had never seen that before. He never heard about that before, but he believed in God so much that he said, even though I've never seen this, God can do this. He didn't limit the God of the universe. He didn't limit the, limit the everlasting one. He said, God, you're able to do this. His faith was unshakable. We sit there with our measly resources. We don't want to give. Because we know if we give, our world is going to come crashing apart. Our bills won't be paid. We're convinced of that. We won't have enough money for anything. It won't, it won't work. Can I challenge you in something? Why don't you step back and watch God work? Maybe he'll solve your problem in a way that no one has ever seen before. That's what Abraham was saying. That's what Hebrew tells us. God can even do something that no one has seen before. I can think of some things no one has seen before, the way God can solve your problems. You need some money? God could give you a money tree out in your front yard. No one's ever seen that before, right? You could be going through a toll booth on the, uh, on the turnpike, and all of a sudden it starts dumping quarters in your back window. No one's ever seen that before. Come on now. There are ways. There are ways that God can do this that no one has ever seen before. There could be a bird flying over your head and drop a million dollars in your lap. No one's ever seen that before. You're like, well, that would never happen, Pastor Oh, come on. Abraham says, God can raise up my only son, and no one has ever seen that before. Why don't you trust God? It's not because God can't do it. It's not because God isn't strong enough or, or capable enough. It's because our faith, our faith is weak. That's the response of Abraham. Lastly, I see the result, the result. In verse 9 and following, they came to the place in Genesis 22, they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. It's a word in the Jewish culture, Akita. They say it's, it's, it means the binding. It refers to the binding of Isaac. You see the submission of Isaac his son being willing to be bound by his father. Knowing or anticipating what would take place. I, in my own mind, imagine Abraham possibly even weeping at this point, though still walking in faith and obedience. In verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. I have heard this before, but I must repeat it again. The first time that God came to him in Genesis 22, verse 1, he said, Abraham, one time, and Abraham said, here am I. In verse number 11, he had to say, Abraham, twice. I don't know why. If it was me, I'd be waiting for that Abraham again. I'd hear the first, hey, I'm done. I got it. Finished. He was so intent on following God, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, verse 12, lay not thine hand upon thine lad, neither Do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering and in the stead of his son. In verse 14, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh, it shall be seen, or my God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, not only is he the God of the universe and the everlasting God and the King of kings, he is now 
the providing God. Abraham says, I learned something about God today. He is the God of provision. When you obey God and you trust God, you will learn about God. When you obey God and you trust God, you will learn about God. And then the following verse, you won't look at them now. But after all this happened, God comes back to Abraham. He spoke to him, the Bible says, a second time. He said, don't forget what I've promised you, Abraham. I've promised you these tremendous blessings. I'm giving you my covenant. I will bless you. I will multiply you. What he's saying is, Abraham, just so you remember, I am as good as my word. I will do what I said I will do. I will provide for you. You will see and your actions will bring blessings. The last verse, verse number 18 of this passage, where the Bible says, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And they add this little phrase at the end. The whole world's going to be blessed, Abraham. Here's the phrase, Because thou hast obeyed my voice. Listen, friend, when you obey God, others are touched by it. When you follow God, others are blessed by it. And to Abraham, he said, all the nations of the earth, everyone will be touched. Not because you're powerful, Abraham. Not because you're smart, but because of your obedience. It comes down to simple obedience. See, so believe God when it doesn't make sense. Obey God when it seems hard. And give to God of all those things that he counts to be valuable. The story is told of a millionaire who loved to testify, uh, to testify about his stewardship. He would often tell how as a young man he sat in a church service with only one dollar to his name. When the offering plate came by, he was impressed to give that one dollar, knowing that when he gave it, he would have absolutely nothing left for himself. Over the years, as the story goes, his testimony became quite a bit repetitious and perhaps a little bit even vain. He would always conclude his testimony by saying, and that's why I am where I am today, because I was willing to give to God everything I had. Apparently one day a dear old saintly lady got tired of what she perceived to be his self-centered testifying storytelling. And at the conclusion of his testimony, after hearing it for the umpteenth time, she said, she said, and he said, that's why I'm here today, because I gave God everything I had. She spoke out loudly and said, and I dare you to do it again. Maybe you're like a, little, a father who gave his little girl two dollars. And he said, you can do anything you want to with the one dollar, but the other dollar belongs to God. With joy, this little girl ran to the candy store on the way, she tripped. One of the dollars fluttered down a storm drain. She got up and said, well, Lord, there goes your dollar. <laughs> or, you're like the preacher who paid a visit to a farmer. He said, if you had $200, would you give $100 to the Lord? Sure would, said the farmer. If you had two cows, would you give one cow to the Lord? Well, yes, I would, said the farmer. If you had two pigs, would you give one to them to the Lord? The farmer replied, well, that's not fair, preacher. You know I have two pigs. <laughs> or like Russell Herman, 67 years old, died in 1994. In his will, he left $2 billion to the city of St. Louis. He left another half a billion, or billion and a half, to the state of Illinois, and two and a half billion dollars for the national forest system. And he also left six trillion dollars to the government to help pay off the national debt. What an amazingly generous man. There was only one problem. The only asset of his estate was a 1983 Oldsmobile. <laughs> he made grand pronouncements with no generosity. Or I wonder if we were like Abraham who if when God spoke to him, he didn't delay, he didn't doubt, he just obeyed. Trusting that his God, I believe, his God will be the God of provision, Jehovah 
Jireh. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have the testimony of Abraham. Lord, there may be someone here who has been struggling or worrying about giving to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to all search our hearts. Lord, you know my heart. My heart in this stewardship month is not for First Baptist Church. It's not so we have a bigger offering. It's so that we're right before you and so others can be touched by it. Lord, help us to be honest. I wonder if there's someone here today who said, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me. God spoke to me maybe about giving, maybe about something else, but as you spoke this morning, Pastor, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me this morning because I want to respond like Abraham in obedience. Would you pray for me this morning? Would you lift your hand up and say, as you spoke, Pastor Howell, God spoke to me. Would you help me to respond like Abraham? Amen. Amen. Who else? Amen. Amen. I want to respond like Abraham in obedience and faith. Who else? I didn't raise it before. I raised it now. God spoke to me this morning. Amen. Amen. I wonder if there's someone here who, if you died, you're not sure that you'd go to heaven. You've never trusted Jesus as your Savior. You didn't maybe before realize that, that God himself provided a lamb and his name was Jesus. And if you died, you're not sure you're, you'd go to heaven. But this morning, if something happened inside your heart, and, and, and while you aren't saved, you sure would like to know how to be saved. I'd love to pray for you when I pray for the others. Who would say, Pastor Howell, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? If you slip your hand up, slip back down, I'll see it. And I'll call no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But I'd love to pray for you this morning. Who say, that's me, Pastor Al. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Just slip your hand up, slip back down, we'll see you. Amen, I see that. Anyone else? Amen. Lord, you've seen these hands. You've seen the ones who have been touched by your spirit this morning. I pray they'd respond. Lord, you've seen this one who, who mentioned that they are not saved. Lord, I pray for them that they'd be willing to come and learn from your Bible how they can know for sure they're going to heaven. Lord, we want to see your work today. Lord, we want to follow you. Lord, bless this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we ask.